Jason. Good evening. It is now 6.02, and I would like to announce that a quorum is present. The meeting has been duly called, and notice of the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. We will now convene into closed session as authorized by Texas Government Code Section 551, specifically 551.071, 072, 074, and 082. And the time is 6.02. Thank you very much.
think you did because this is... And they're all telling me they have this master plan and what Good evening, everyone. Miss Latham, Miss Latham. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Louisville Independent School District Board of Trustees. The time is 7.06. We will now reconvene into open session. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America. Thank you very much. Um, I need a, to, a motion to consider items discussed in the closed session. Motion, Ms. Fowdy. You want to read the record? You want to read them? The motion, Ms. Fowdy. Second, Ms. Latham. Yes, please, ma'am. Move the. Oh. oh, sorry. I move that all personnel recommendations be approved as presented by administration. A motion is Fowdy, second Ms. Latham. 
All in favor? That is unanimous. There are no awards this evening. Oh, okay. That's unusual. Excuse me, ma'am. Okay, we're going to uh, move on to the request to address the board. Persons desiring to address the board of trustees must fill out a speaker's card prior to the meeting. I have four. No presentation shall exceed three minutes. And we have our handy dandy clock up on the screen. And the board cannot deliberate on any subject that is not included on the agenda. So, the first name I have, and I'm sorry if I, if I crucify him, it's Jerry Wang. Wengendit, W-E-G-E-N-D-T. Good evening, sir. That on now. Thanks. Uh, the Marcus ninth grade facility, that the concession facility that's being built at this time. A number of the parents, we've looked at some of the uh, the issues with the building itself. This is not the 28 acre facility. This is just the facility for the teams, the locker rooms, and the concession stand. If you'll bear with me, there's a number of items there that are on this list. I certainly don't have time to review all of them, but most of the uh, areas of concern on that talking paper. Uh, for you to look at later a large shared concession stand on the west side I'm not sure who designed the building I know it went through the charrette and I know it went through a lot of people discussing the building but we have a large concession stand that's on the west side of the building in Texas with total exposure to the west side no exposure to any of the facility it's too large and it's not going to work for any of the team's needs there's not a, a the hallways are set up one long hallway in the middle splitting up a lot of the, the extra size of the rooms and the rooms are too large for a lot of the facility itself and I say storage is on the south side of the building uh, the storage areas are away from the field the two teams have shared hallways and access points we're worried about the security and safety of the individuals there's no team room and I say no team room when I say we're gonna have some sort of rally point someplace for kids to meet bad weather inclement weather and I've been told that that's going to be the hallway. So I'm just, I just want to know who designed the building and, and what process we went through. And that on, the, on that review cycle, if somebody could meet with the parents, I would love to meet with any of the board members at any time to discuss this. I've talked to Mr. McDaniel about this. A number of the parents have concern about the fact that we're building a brand new facility. The, the tennis courts are set up really nicely with the coaches' inputs. The softball courts are set up really nice, the, or softball fields then we don't have really an input on the building and no one has been able to tell us where the building came and the design from it. It kind of looks like a basketball facility without the basketball courts. And I don't know where it came from, so we'd just like somebody to help us with that and I would love to meet with any of you. Um, we addressed this originally to the architect. The architect addressed us to speak to Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry said then to speak to the coaches the coaches had had a review cycle August 22nd. After that review cycle took place, the plans were already in place. The flower mound permits were already in place. The coaches feedback to us was the fact that they're happy with the facility. The, the, the principal's happy with the facility. We understand that, but we just don't understand how the review cycle took place. And, and those, those inputs on that would certainly help a better facility with a 50 year plan going forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Moving on, I have Mr. Wes Jones. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Wes Jones, and I'm here to talk to you all about the uh, Bible curriculum. I know that it's been addressed a couple of years ago, and I know a lot of the board members are new. Um, I feel very strongly that this is needed um, for multiple reasons. Um, I don't know what y'all's background, religious beliefs, faiths are, but you know, my main request is that you don't necessarily do what me or others want you to do, but, but uh, 
consider seriously praying about it and 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 doing what the Lord wants you to do and, and moving because I think it's I think it's needed for the students. I think one of the main problems we're having in the world today is with so many things that the Bible has been taking out of and. Uh, you know, I was a police officer for 16 years, and a lot of the calls I went on where we had problems with teens were, um, you know, and I, I, I talked with teens and their parents, and I would say 99% of them, there was no, they didn't know anything about the Bible, they didn't, hadn't been exposed to it, and I, and I really believe that that's what's leading a lot of our teens down the wrong path, is the fact that they just, they don't have that opportunity and, and I know this would be an elective so I mean I don't think you're forcing it on anybody um, that you know if the parents don't want them to have it but I, I really feel there's a need there for that opportunity for the for the kids that do want it to uh, have that opportunity to to where they're not I guess isolated from you know maybe some of the kids that that I guess are negative about it or don't have any knowledge about it and then there, there might be some that they want to know and they don't have the opportunity because their parents you know are not led that way and um, I really think that it's very important that y'all make a, a yes vote on that and get Bible in the class thank you thank you sir the next the next is uh, Shanna Jones Hi, my name is Shanna. I'm here to I'm here tonight to ask you to consider adding an elective Bible class to the high school curriculum. I've always had Bible as a part of my schedule and has made a big impact on my life. I believe the Bible class will make an impact on others as well. I've talked to some of my classmates and they would be interested in the Bible class too. If it was was an optional part of the curriculum, kids would not have to choose between extracurricular activities in Bible classes. There are so many things that we have to offer. We have after school and there's not much time. Bible classes would be a different opportunity and format rather than what FCA has to offer. I believe adding options will help kids understand the importance of good behavior and help prevent bullying. I know everyone's situation is different, but I have a friend whose parents are deaf, so she does not have the same church opportunities as others may. I know Bible class would help her with her challenges she faces. This class could make a difference in someone's life. I know it's important to me and I hope it will be important to you as well. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And uh, Stephen Smith. that uh, Penny put, that put together a couple years ago. And uh, Lyle Benson, pastor at Aldersgate United Methodist Church is here. He's also a member of that task force, along with Penny Riddell. Um, and um, I'm here to speak on, uh, on the Bible literacy program as well. Um, in 2009, the Texas legislature deemed studying the Bible's influence on our literature and history helped ready our children for college. In a bipartisan vote of 167 to 3, the Texas legislature put a law into effect, into basically put that into effect. We came before this board in 2010 and demonstrated the public's desire for such a course. Dr. Riddell graciously took up our request, identified a curriculum, Bible and its influence, secured books, and put together a multi-faith task force of eight of us. To review this curriculum, by a vote of seven to one, we decided this was a good curriculum and it did ready our kids for college. No action was taken by this board. There were a couple of objections at the time. One was the fear of a lawsuit. Comment was, let's give it a little more time, what we have. It's been three years since the law was passed. Despite there being a proliferation of this curriculum throughout Texas, there have been no legal challenges. An academic study of the Bible in public schools is legal in all 50 states. The Supreme Court in 1963 said that we could, they banned the, um, 
worship of the Bible in a classroom, but not the academic study of the Bible in the classroom. Justice Thomas Clark wrote for the majority opinion, nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or religion, when presented objectively as a part of a secular program of education, may not, affected, may not be affected consistently with the First Amendment. Additionally, we're talking about an elective course. That is, students have a choice to take this course or not. No one is mandating the class. However, if we teach this curriculum as presented, students will recognize its academic value. And as Lisa Thibodeau, Plano Curriculum Administrator said, it's a neat kind of kid that wants an academic elective. Plano has been teaching this curriculum for three years. It's now on three campuses. Furthermore, LISD would not be a pioneer. There's nothing new. This curriculum is nothing radical. Numerous large exceptional school districts from the Metroplex to Houston to West Texas have implemented this. Religious Liberty has agreed to defend free of charge any school district in concert with the Bible in the public schools, also provided by Penny. Any loss, any, any school that's sued. The other objection we heard was the cost. We have secured a $75,000 grant to get the class off the ground. In conclusion, this course is so rich in cultural knowledge, art, literature, and history that many college professors from Rice, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford have gone on record saying such a course gives incoming freshmen an academic advantage. That's an academic advantage we would like to have for our students. Okay, thank you very much, sir. That's your three minutes, so. Moving on. Moving on to informational items. LISD strategic design. Madam Chair, members of the board, this is our, our monthly update on our activities to date on our strategic design implementation. The first part of the uh, memorandum uh, is a recognition that uh, Louisville Independent School District is one of 23 school districts that have been selected to participate in the Texas High Performance Schools Consortium. The other 22 school districts, for your information, are listed uh, in the first part of the memorandum for you. So that is a huge uh, step forward for our district and we're very excited about being one of the selected participants. Our first meeting regarding the uh, consortium will be in Austin October 23rd. The second part of the presentation uh, is regarding our business partnership advisory committee that Ms. Permetti from the communications office uh, has put together and she does have a uh, presentation in terms of what this committee is all about, what we hope to accomplish and also at the bottom of the page is a list of the committee members. Hopefully you will know some of these members from our community. Ms. Permetti, would you like to share your presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm very, very excited to share with you about this initiative. This comes directly from our strategic design as one of the um, strategic outcomes that the action team researched and developed and presented to the strategic design team that was unanimously approved. So, um, Chris. partnership presentation. As you can see how this evolved was basically from strategic design goal number five, what that um, communicates continuously involve our diverse community staff and students to use their strengths, resources, and talents to provide engaging, innovative experiences. And it's strategic outcome 5.3, and it says create partnerships with businesses, community organizations, local government, higher education institutions, your future. So obviously we have launched a partnership advisory committee and their charge is to create a partnership framework and evaluation matrix system for success. 
And basically what this means in a fancy way is that we want to customize a partnership program that will work for our school district. We had looked at originally several uh, partnership programs that were successful in other districts. Um, we've looked at programs that you can purchase and we felt what was out there did not speak to our strategic design and the spirit of that strategic design. And so through some research, we decided that let's follow the strategic design process. Obviously that became very successful in involving our community and identifying where they wanted to take our district. And we thought we should take the same approach. Not only did we think we should take the same approach to customize a framework that will benefit our students, but also they're the ones that will determine whether we're successful. And so instead of the communications department saying, look, we're successful, this is how many partnerships we have, et cetera, we felt it was in our best interest that they define what those success matrix look like. So in essence, they're the ones that um, will be determining whether we're successful year in, year out. So here's the committee's process. We have 35 total number of commu committee members. We have seven students, so we have one representing from each one of our feeder patterns and then our career centers. Um, so, and here's all the industries that we have represented. If you look closely, they're in line with the um, strategic outcome um, that was 5.3. So we have healthcare represented, technology, banking, government, childcare, nonprofits, government, and small business owners. So we are following the strategic design process. We are actually contracted with Engage, which is Shannon Burke's firm but we have um, a facilitator that she recommended to um, help us with that. And in fact, she also helped with Shannon throughout the strategic design process last year. So she's very familiar with that, uh, with our process and the information that came from it. Because if you recall, a lot of the summits, people did speak about how they were stay-at-home moms but had former careers and they want to be utilized. So we wanted to make sure we used all that data from the summits to help us create this framework and give that data to the community members that are serving. So um, overall, the whole um, process, they will be collaborating and they will be creating, designing, and developing a framework. And as a matter of fact, they have homework. So they just don't come for two to three hours. They actually have homework. Um, that they have to do during the course of the week and report back to their peers. So here's our committee timeline. Um, September 11th, we kicked it off. October 16th, next Tuesday is our meeting, a second meeting, um, and they will share the research and their homework that they have um, been doing, and we hope from that point we'll be able to identify key themes for this particular framework. So November 6th, they'll be hash it out and they will actually form a rough draft of that framework and they will um, begin to make their presentation to the strategic design team so that they engage them to get their feedback to make sure we're meeting the spirit of 5.3. And then in March, um, we hope to also begin working on the matrix and identifying training um, processes and procedures that we need to have in place for implementation next school year. And I wanted to bring you to the very, very last part of the paragraph that's up there. Through this entire process, at a minimum, these members will have given 700 hours to this process. Here's your committee. As you can see, we have a lot of diversity and we have all of our feeder patterns represented. And not only that, we have majority of our 13 municipalities represented. And from our cities and schools, one of our success stories is that um, Mr. Gordon from uh, Coppell has decided to join the committee because he was thrilled about the Career Center East and wanted to be involved as an engineer. And so we have a success story, so we put him on our committee. And also, for your information, we are the first in the nation to have customized a complete partnership program. So nobody has gone through this process where it's totally organic where we are developing something that is uniquely special for LISD. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Permitti. The third part of the presentation is about our strategic design coaches. And when I was here in September, I mentioned um, that our coaches were going through boot camp. Well, they have successfully completed boot camp. And in addition to uh, disrupting class that they've been working on 
they have also been working with our campuses and looking at various projects that our campuses and teachers might be interested in. So at this time, uh, Dr. Beth Brockman, who's our Executive Director for Professional Learning, is going to provide an update on what's next for our design coaches. Good evening. It has been an exciting few weeks working with this group of extremely talented individuals that not only have we been able to push their thinking, they've pushed ours right back. And um, I think they're doing the same on the campuses with the, with the teachers and the principals. So let me just give you a little update of where we are. I'm fortunate that I'm joined by quite the group, and you can see their names there, um, that is engaged with planning for this group. It is a collaborative effort. Um, we, we make sure that not only are we balancing the needs of the strategic design, but also the support needs of teachers and moving forward, making sure also that our coaches are supported as many of them are coming out of the classroom for the first time. And this is quite a different experience than being a classroom teacher. One of our groups actually designed a commercial for the strategic design and their work over the next uh, year. I wanted you to see that. over. I really don't need to say anything else. To say that this group is passionate about working with teachers and campuses to move our education system into what our kids need is an understatement. We have 40 in all, 13 are specializing in learning technology, 6 in assessment, and 21 in instructional design. We have broken them down by zone, and you can see those numbers there, 
But what we're finding to be true is they're working more and more across the zones as they're finding similarities in projects. Here are some of the current areas of project work, and this is being driven by principals and teachers and their requests on campuses. Facilitating dialogue to deepen faculty understanding. Many of them were engaged today in these activities as we had a campus professional learning day. Utilizing gaming as an instructional strategy. We're very excited about that. Problem-based learning. Engagement through student choice in the, in the work that they do. Innovative formative assessment options has been requested by several campuses, as well as utilizing technology to connect with students outside of school, outside of the United States. So a lot of exciting projects that they're working on, and they're finding that, oh, we're doing this in the East Zone, we're doing it in the West Zone or Central Zone, so let's pair up and work together. We're very excited about where this is going to go. We have already um, seen a deeper understanding and passion from the coaches than I even thought we would have at this point. I think the uh, world is their oyster and it's going to be neat to see at the end of the year where these coaches help our campuses and individual teachers go with our students as it relates to the strategic design. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brockman. In addition to what you have briefly observed, what our design coaches are uh, accomplishing with such passion and enthusiasm, I also wanted to share with you, and that's the attachment to this document, um, we were asked by the North Texas Regional uh, Consortium to submit a, a list of exemplars that we are uh, designing and working on in the district. So in addition to what you see the coaches working on, we wanted you to also see some of the other initiatives that we have going on in the district. And as you read through the list of several pages, we, are, we have phenomenal teachers in our district. All right, I, if you did not get the attachment, I will make sure that you do get the attachment. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on, Louisville ISD Education Foundation Annual Report, Ms. Palfrey. I believe we have some guests here tonight along with Ms. Palfrey. Some of your board members here? Would you all please stand? Yes, would my board please stand? A group of dedicated uh, individuals that help us help our children. So we appreciate all the hard work you do. Ms. Palfrey, go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity tonight to come and update you on what LEF has been doing over the past year or so. Um, I look forward to it. I was excited to see that last um, presentation because it's exactly what LEF wants to do. We want to become engaged. We want to help how we can to um, engage students and encourage them in any, their lifelong careers. So hopefully we can get involved in some of those projects and help with some funding and things. Oh, back one. Should be another one in between there. Okay, there should have been a slide <laughs> that talks about um, the organization. In 1990, a group of district uh, leaders and community leaders got together and decided that there was a need for additional resources within the, for the students and their teachers. So they formed at that time the Louisville Education Foundation. We are one of the oldest foundations in, this, in the state of Texas and um, we're recognized by several different organizations. Since then, we have added the word LISD to our name because we felt it was important for the whole school district to realize that we represent them and we are our, our, um, looking for money or asking for money in, on their behalf, so that not just Louisville. I know. Um, the foundation is governed by a set of 22 volunteer board members. They come from across the district. As you can see, um, the East Zone, West Zone, and Central. They represent corporations, local businesses, community volunteers, and retired uh, LISD members. But they all have one thing in common. They're very passionate about public school education and how they can help and encourage LISD students in particular. 
As you might notice, if you can add up, those numbers don't add up to 22 members, it's 21. We do have one open spot and we are currently looking for them, uh, for someone to fill that spot, but we are particular in who we ask to join our board. We want to make sure that there's someone that's going to provide uh, the resources and the uh, attributes that we need to keep the board strong and keep the foundation moving forward. Allocation, so where do we provide money to LISD? We've provided three main programs, one being scholarships. That was one of the original pro areas that we su have supported since the beginning. Also for teachers, for grants, to help them continue their education. And then, all, gr then grants in general, general uh, meaning for classrooms and campus grants. The last couple years, the foundation board has really put an emphasis on raising funds for teacher grants. We feel there's a bigger impact, we can provide a bigger impact to um, the students and their learning and their environment by going, providing extra money in that area and, and instead of other areas. Since the beginning of 2011-2000 school year, the foundation has awarded either through grants, scholarships, or fellowships almost $225,000 to help students and teachers within the school district. As I said, our different programs, scholarships are one. Um, we award, in May, we awarded 179 different scholarships valued at $116,000. This is not our highest, but it also depends on who our donors are at the time. And there is a uh, myth, and I get this question a lot when we get down to uh, awarding scholarships, are they only for students that are the top ranking of their classes? And the answer is no. Our scholarships criteria vary according to our donors. We have scholarships that are for some high-ranking class members. We also have a scholarship that's for somebody that wants to go into a technical career and everything in between. So um, we encourage, we usually have about 400 applicants and we have community members that read through all those 400 applications and believe me that takes a little time and we really appreciate them doing that. Classroom grants, again I said this is our emphasis um, in August, we awarded $87,000, or a little over actually, $87,000 in grants. And these grants this year helped fund iPads, Nooks, books, and some outdoor door learning experiences. We um, look forward to increasing this, and we also look forward to visiting each of the different classrooms where the grants were awarded to see how they're being, the impact they're making on those students and then you go back to our donors and letting them know the impact of where their dollars or their investment comes from or goes to. We are currently looking at um, campus grants. Those grants are valued up to $5,000 and they'll be awarded in the next few weeks. So some additional monies will be available. Besides the grants that we award through our normal evening for education, golf tournament, and other fundraising activities, we have partnered with several um, community partnerships. At the end of the school year last year, the Central Park Area Neighbors Association came to us and said that they had some money they would like to award um, to campuses within their area. So we worked with uh, Buddy Botter in the Central um, Zone to get to ask for some applications. And in, in the end, $53,000 was awarded to um, campuses within their area to, and the main focus there again was um, outdoor learning the areas for each of the different campuses. As you know, a couple of months ago, Verizon came and they awarded, they announced their award uh, that Kilo was one of 12 schools across the United States to be selected for a teacher staff development for, in technology area. They awarded $40,000, but what you might not know is the foundation added additional $10,000 on that to make sure that was the grant was fully funded. Uh, the Miles Foundation is a small uh, foundation out of, used to be out of Argyle, and they're now at Fort, in Fort Worth. We've partnered with them a couple years now, and um, we've asked them for $10,500 to help fund several different programs, mostly STEM research. That's their main focus, STEM research, uh, STEM, STEM programs and um, history, because their founder was really big on history. So we actually have one grant this year that we were asking them to fund that's a history program that they want to use iPads for. So we've combined the two, and we feel we will get that money sometime in December. So 
In order to do all this, LEF needs to be have a sound financial um, base. And as a nonprofit, over the last couple of years, things have changed. It used to be that people, when they saw a nonprofit, they really didn't expect it to be run for business. They were doing good things. Let them do their good things, and you know, don't really worry about the finances. And are they doing an audit and that? Well, those times are long gone. And I'll let you know that LAF does run. We do run our business with sound business practices. We um, manage all of our donations, things, and expenses that way. Currently, we have 2.7 million dollars of assets. These are um, invested by BlackRock through our Merrill Lynch trust account and the interest and dividends from that help pay for some of our programs each year. Since 1990, which is again our conception 22 years ago, um, we have provided over $2 million in awards to the school district to benefit the stu students and teachers. Now I talked about business practices and one of the business practices that we do is an annual audit and I'm happy to say that we have never had any findings you all have copies of our 2011 audit. In addition, you have a copy of our 2010 19, uh, 990 tax return. We are currently working on our 2011. We'll have it available for you soon. When I pull these charts, you might, they're kind of small and you might not really notice, but August, the red, the one in the bottom there, the red is our expenses and they're very high. That's because of back to school activities and evening for education expenses. All of the money in September um, had not come in yet from Eating for Education, so that income will be much higher, and we'll balance out those two. So fun, our funding comes from several different areas. In 2011, we um, had income of over $500,000. As of September this year, we are already almost to $525,000. So we've already exceeded last year. And um, part of this is due to our, the success of our Evening for Education. We were up 25% this year in, on net income for that. Also our golf tournament was up this year. And um, one more important area was up 23% and that was the employee giving through um, program that from the employees. And we are really, really excited that the employees believe in the foundation and that they support us because that enables us then to go back to donors in the community and talk about the, how we are supported by staff and teachers um, and they believe in the foundation and then they know that they believe in it so then our donors start believing in it and why it should, we should be doing it. The remaining amounts come from outside grants, endowments, people in st established endowments, and those numbers are starting to grow also for this year. Now I'd like to introduce Lori Walker, our president. She has a few words to talk about our strategic focus and what we're working on for the rest of the year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. This is very exciting um, to be able to present our state of LEF to you. We are um, thrilled to be here, and um, on behalf of my board, I thank you for all of your support. At our annual retreat um, back in June, <clears throat> our board began the process of aligning our strategic goals with the district's strategic plan. And once our strategic plan is completed, um, it will allow our foundation to grow and to improve with the district. And we've identified four key areas that will be our strategic focus um, and that, that, um, going forward. One, um, you will see is the LISD liaison. We are working to increase the awareness of LEF uh, within this LISD community. Um, we have 200 miles, um, 13 communities, um, over 50,000 students. So it is always a challenge of um, keeping our you know keeping everyone aware we are um, mirroring the district's forward thinking plan um, of the three zone leaders we have identified on our board three zone leaders and we will work with with those zone leaders to see how to best um, serve each of the areas of our district our second fo focus is going to be communication and marketing marketing opportunities um, are changing as fast as technology in the classroom um, our goal is to explore and um, to keep um, 
fresh on all the new aspects of communication and marketing. The third area you will see is development. Um, the LEF development goal is to, con is to increase individual and parent support. 78% of all philanthropic support from across the U.S. comes from individuals. And we are going to work um, and look at new ways to share our exciting programs with our new donors. And then finally, programs and staffing. Um, for 20 years, the um, LEF has been a strong organization, but we are always having to continue to change every year. For example, in 1990, when our organization started, we provided just books for classrooms. This year, we provided iPads. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm blown away that our, our technology grows and changes as much as it does. Um, with the many changes that are taking place in our district and our world, we are going to continue to work um, and look at new, new and innovative ways to deliver programs and um, keeping our staff forward thinking. On behalf of our foundation and board um, of directors, we would like to thank you for your continued support and thank you tonight. We're going to um, discuss later our memorandum of understanding and we thank you um, for all of the long hours we've worked on to bring that to um, a conclusion. We want to thank you for helping the foundation change the lives um, over, of children over the past 22 years. LEF looks forward to our continued partnership and growth benefiting the students and the teachers of LISD. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Moving on from informational items to uh, technology blended model, uh, Ms. Brown, or who is going to be speaking on Well, you are not Ms. Brown. I am not Ms. Brown. Madam President, Dr. Waddell, esteemed members of the board, my name is Jerem Frozy, and I'm your new Director of Educational Technology, and I'd like to thank you not only for the time to listen to such an important topic tonight, but also for the warm welcome that I've received here in LISD. It's been a lot of fun. So the, uh, the gentleman you see up here on the screen, his name is Soji. I've run into him a couple times over at LHS Maine. He's a student there. And I've got a story to tell about Soji and about, really, Louisville students in general. So before we get started, I'd like to kind of track through a little bit of history. Soji and Louisville students have kind of come through this process where we've learned a lot about implementing technology in our classrooms. We started out with traditional classrooms that were in rows with desks and chairs. And we've progressed from there onto a little bit uh, more contemporary thinking. We've brought technology into our classrooms. We've added technology into our classrooms, but what's the message that we're sending when we see technology sitting on the side along the wall? We've continued to change our thinking. We've built grouping into our classrooms, and we've even come to the point where we're bringing laptops into the classroom in a way that is flexible and mobile. But we still see teachers driving instruction, teacher-centered instruction. And so as our team, our technology team, started to look at the 12,000 computers that we have to refresh this fall, we knew that we had a task before us to change our thinking and to change our model. So our old refresh model is based on this concept of taking the old machines out and replacing them with new machines. We just swap them out from the classroom they're in and we give them a fresh model to, to renew the year and get us started. But not only do we have 12,000 machines this year, but we've got another 7,500 coming next year. And in thinking about the strategic design and the vision that was laid forth, we knew we had to change our legacy model for refreshing computers. And so as our team started to plan, we, we had a lot of discussions and a lot of talking, but we ended up walking upstairs to training room D and looking at some of the products that our strategic design coaches were putting up along the walls. And this is one of them. This is a model workspace. And our team stood there looking at the wall and realized that it was an epiphany that hit that refreshing our old model is not going to achieve this vision for where we want to go. A vision of flexible classrooms, of project-based learning, and we really knew what we needed to do. 
So tonight I'm talking to you about a new model. Not a model that's an iPad implementation. There are a lot of people doing iPad implementations around the state. In fact, there's some in our backyard, Mansfield, Arlington. They're both putting 10,000 iPads in the hands of teachers and students. But we're talking about something that's different. We're talking about maintaining the BYOD initiative so that students have their preferred device that they have in their pockets and can continue to use that. And we're talking about bringing in the more powerful tool that allows us to do the high-level content creation that we know our students need to have access to. And so as we built this model out in our minds, we started tossing around some names, but we knew that this was not your average one-to-one. -one. one to any, the right device to the right time, one to un, because we're going to be undoing a lot of things with this model in classrooms. But really, Alan Kahutek, one of our instructional technology specialists, kind of really refined our thinking on this, and we're settling in on this. One to X. For every student, we provide the device they need when they need it. So here's the thing. We, we have students that are now in their digital world. We know that times have changed. Uh, you can either ask my daughter, who in the middle of our trip to California said, Dad, the internet's slow. We were in the middle of the Mojave Desert, by the way. My son, who will walk up to your TV and start to swipe it because he thinks it ought to be swipeable. Or the student from LHS Maine, we talked to her, and she's, she told us about how she begins her work on the bus on the way home after school. She starts it in her phone and then finishes it when she gets home. Our learners, our students, are already in charge of their own learning. And we have the decision to make whether or not we will meet them there. So thinking about this model, thinking about the imperative that we know is laid out before us, we're looking at some products that are going to meet that need. And the products that we begin looking at are Apple products, and there are three primary reasons why. Number one, we know that we've got to find something that is going to be student-driven in the classroom, something that allows students, opens up their freedom and their creativity. Apple products are inherently creative. They have software that's built in that not only allows you to create, but allows you to do it in a very easy way and in a very short amount of time. And lastly, every time I open up an Apple product, it comes on and it works. And if I ask a teacher in a classroom or on a campus how often they've been frustrated with the slowness of a PC starting up or shutting down, I will guarantee you, and I've already done this, every hand will go up. Apple products are going to gain us more instructional time, but they're also going to gain us different instructional time when we start to turn things back over to the students and allow them to be participants in their learning. And this is what the 1 to X model is all about. So there are some things we know we need to do in order to get here. There's a lot of planning to do. And we're looking at four different components for how we're laying out that process. One is the infrastructure. We've got the implementation model and how we define it. We know we've got to build in the professional learning. And we also have to think about scaling. I'd ask Patrick Johnson, manager of network and technical services, to come up and uh, speak to us about the infrastructure component. Good evening. Um, what I want to discuss is how large this network really is. I'm not sure if everybody realizes it. but. Um, when we talk about WANs or wide area networks, uh, we connect 78 facilities and 68 of those facilities are the campuses. Um, the district covers 127 square miles and between the staff and the students we have about 60,000 users. And that doesn't count the BYOT logging in too. Um, and then there's uh, 50,000 computers. So um, we're, we're pretty big. So when I talk about WAN, I'm talking about the district as a whole and all the collected uh, connections between the buildings. Um, when we see NOC Network Operations Center, that's located here at the Bowen uh, Admin Building. Now, if we drill down to the building level, we talk about WANs, local area networks. Um, each LAN has a data closets in it, and there's a main data closet, and there's intermediate data closets. And uh, 
what, what those require is um, HVAC and electricity to run the networking gear. That's also the point where the cabling and, and wireless access points all uh, get fed onto the network. Um, what we need to do is um, <clears throat> to consider doing some infrastructure upgrades. And when we, when we look at the pro progression, what we did during the summer was we went into our network operations center and we upgraded it and brought it to enterprise level. And uh, thanks to Dr. Waddell and the board, um, we introduced the Cisco Systems uh, Nexus 7000 platform. Um, it's top of the line, it's inter enterprise grade. Um, another thing we did was we increased the pipes, a lot of the pipes out that feed out to the campuses on the WAN. And um, the next step was we also beefed up our pipe to the internet. So previously, it was a one gig. If you thought of it as a water pipe for data, it was one gigabit. Now we've moved up to three gigabits. Um, we orchestrated it in such a way that we would be able to expand that to 10 gig over time as we see a lot more internet traffic come out of our network and maybe more cloud-based uh, activities and just um, internet interactivity in general. We're ready for the future. Um, collectively, those are foundational to where we're headed um, with the district and the plans that, that are being folded out in front of you tonight. So what our, what our intention, our next steps is to do wireless overlays in all the buildings and have that ready. And that will support BYOT and, and this initiative, but our, our goal is to have this by the time school opens um, next school year. Thank you, Patrick. And it's absolutely crucial that we look at our infrastructure. These are the pieces that happen every day that make our business possible without us really thinking about it. And having a good, solid infrastructure in place is an imperative in order to be able to move forward. So what does this implementation look like in a classroom? Every kid will have access to a tablet, like an iPad. They'll still have access to their preferred device, which may be a mobile. And then they'll also have access in the secondary classroom to five Mac Airs that allow for that more powerful content creation. Again, this really provides that vision of the right device at the right time. The third component is professional learning. This is a really interesting picture that I took just last week. And it's the result of three different departments coming together to plan. The Department of Learning and Teaching, the Department of Professional Learning and Instructional Technology all sat down in a room and this was the result. A little bit crazy, but the conversation would not have been the same without the collaboration that happened. And what we're learning is that as we build a, a solid professional learning plan for what it looks like in order to go through this kind of implementation, that it boils down to these three key components. We've got to provide the initial support, providing the tools to teachers before we provide to students. We've got to, we've got to provide sustained learning, and we've got to build core capacity on each campus that moves forward. Then lastly, we're thinking through the scaling component. And there are a lot of different puzzle pieces that play into scaling. We've got the financial component. We've got options as far as financing that range from bond to IMA to pooling campus resources, amongst others. And we know that we've got to plan out different ways that we can go through our purchase options, that there are purchase uh, we can buy straight out or where you can look at leasing. And we've got to additionally evaluate our stakeholder input and the ability for parents to participate in the insurance process or to have a buyout plan once our devices are ready to recycle. We also know that we've got to develop multiple uh, plans for support where we're continuing that support infrastructure, but we're also allowing each campus to customize the package so that it fits their needs. And then lastly, the scope component, where we build model implementations, we revise our model after we learn, and we evaluate the devices that we're putting into place. One of the key things that we've got to be focused on is the ability with all of these moving puzzle pieces to be flexible in our implementation as we move forward. So let's come back to Soji. Student at LHS Maine, Soji from this picture could be working in a traditional classroom environment, right? Soji's a little bit different. Soji's really leveraging BYOD. 
He's working on his own time in the LHS library. He has his tablet, his laptop, and his mobile that he's brought. And he's leveraging the tools that he knows he needs that he may not have access to in the classroom environment. But not every student has access to all these devices. And from what we're looking at, on the high side, it looks like we can provide teacher and student access for about $1,400 a student. And if we look at a four-year refresh cycle, this is what that boils down to. And this is the question that we really need to begin asking ourselves. Folks, our students are already here. And they're going to continue to go there outside of the school, outside of the parenting circles, We've got to make the choice on whether or not we're going to meet students where they're at. Through 1 to X, I really believe that we can. And I really believe that as the mission of the Visioning Institute states, that we really can begin to transform our schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeremy. A lot of information. We're going to move on to the K-12 Insight. Erin, Ms. Prometti. We have another exciting initiative that we want to bring forward to you. Um, as you know, we've heard a lot about strategic design, and you will continue to hear a lot of that. And as you may see, some of the themes through our strategic design is feedback and input from our community. And in fact, a lot of our strategic outcomes clearly articulates the need to um, gain feedback, survey, get data, see if we're headed in the right direction if we're being successful. Well, to do that at a massive scale, because we are quite a large dis district, um, we, uh, we knew we needed to put this, um, research these options to provide this to our community. We have it in our budget. And um, part as our research evolved, K-12 Insights came up with a package that we feel um, meets our needs. And basically, K-12 Insights provides tools and technologies that allow our district to expand engagement by providing easy to understand information while simultaneously gathering data. And so um, we asked Mr. Daniel Carter with K-12 Insights here tonight to share how his organization works, as well as other public school districts um, that have had success with K-12. Mr. Carter. Aaron, uh, board president, members of the board, Dr. Waddell, thank you for uh, allowing me to come out and tell you about, about our company. A um, little background on us, uh, we've been serving well over 300 school districts since founding in 2004. Uh, we work with a number of districts in Texas, uh, some of them including Northwest, Duncanville, Cedar Hill, Rock, Rockwall, Grand Prairie, HEB, uh, most recently Irving, Allen ISD. We have partnerships with AASA and 12 of their state affiliates, including TASA, and then strategic partnerships with, with ENSPRA and NSBA. What is Trust Capital? I don't think I need to tell anyone in this room what it is. Uh, what we focus on is building that uh, clear, systemic engagement process between the district and every single stakeholder within the community and also within the district itself and help you re replenish those reserves and make them part of the process. Uh, why is this something that has been problematic for districts? Uh, what we found is that with the advent of technology and uh, back in the day, if I wanted to know what was going on in LISD, I would just pick up the, your local community newspaper. And what we've seen is with the advent of technology, now you're dealing with many other media platforms. People just don't read their local newspapers like they used to. So how do you maintain, how do you become that conduit between the district and everyone else out there that you serve. So there's also some, some additional problems with, with those mediums, and that's there's a level of anonymity out there that uh, you're constantly dealing with 
information that could be unfounded, untrue, and, and you're in that position of having to respond to that. So in trying to drive your message out there and having it be clear and concise, what we've done is created um, a multi-prong approach to being able to allow you to engage the community and also have an ear and be able to, to allow them to be part of the process. So if you could uh, imagine this, uh, your standard bell curve here is the opinion spectrum on any given issue. Uh, you always hear from those folks who feel one way or another on any given issue, but we found that there's a, a large number of folks within the community that just don't have a chance to participate. They're either very, very busy, uh, they don't know how to participate, they can't come to board meetings. So we help them, to, we help them become part of that process and help you build a relationship with them uh, and create a level of transparency that really school districts have had a difficult time in achieving. Uh, over the last five, ten years. So it, really providing that platform for collaborative decision making, allowing you to educate and inform, and also immunize yourself from those blogs, myths, and tweets. Uh, helping build, you, build a brand so you can leverage it and market your vision for the district. We know that a number of one-way communication efforts are going on. Your website, uh, printed newsletters, all call systems. Those are great. What we're talking about is a two-way engagement strategy, and that's reaching out to the community, reaching out to folks internally, allowing them to be part of the process. So looking at surveys as not instruments of mere research, but as a way to forge a two-way dialogue, and using that dialogue to educate and inform of opportunities and challenges uh, before the district, and doing so through well-planned communication, earning the sympathy, support, and, and trust of uh, one person at a time of all of your stakeholders, both internal and external, and then weaving that into the fabric and culture of your, of the way you operate, uh, your operating culture. So, uh, and I'm trying to go very fast because I know I've got about 10 minutes here. So, <laughs> beyond traditional research, we know that you're doing data collection. We make sure that you're asking the right questions. You're looking at this, uh, at these results over time. So you're looking at benchmarking and trend analysis. Uh, building a Your Voice section on your website if you'd like us to. Uh, this is a fully customized solution for the district. It allows people within the community to be able to participate uh, and see the calendar of engagement events that you have planned throughout the year. So that's sharing those findings through that dashboard. We do all the analysis, interpretation, reporting. We're showing you how we're increasing participation over time. Uh, and then ensuring that, there, that there's controls for data integrity, that there's no one out there who's ballot box stuffing a particular survey. So what we do is we set the stage before each initiative. We, uh, you know, we'll, we'll write the correspondence that goes out and invites that particular stakeholder group to be part of the process. We create the tool, um, we disseminate it, collect it, do the analysis interpretation, and then close the loop with all those respondents so they know what happened. Uh, and, and so they can feel like that their that their voice has been heard, and, and that's done on each and every each and every engagement. So, really, what do we look like? We're a communication and public relations group. We have our research group. We have our technology, which is a survey platform that has well over a hundred uh, vetted instruments that we've used for districts all across the country and then of course full support and we basically plug right into the district and everything that we do as far as engagement revolves around those high level issues such as strategic planning, um, TRE preparation, bond preparation, really building up that conversation leading up to those, to those events. So every single uh, approach that we, that we have with the district is fully customized based upon your unique history, unique community challenges, priorities, and goals. Everything's fully customized, all the pre and post communication, uh, creating a survey calendar so you know in advance, uh, so everyone can know in advance when you're going to be reaching out to them, handling and conducting focus groups on various issues as you need them within the district, and then bringing every single department within the district together so there's one clear and concise message that goes out into the community. So finding that silent majority, the key with what we do is we're not out there reaching for a sample of each given stakeholder group. 
Everyone's invited to participate, and that's the power of what we drive within the community. We do all the training. It's multimodal. We want to ensure that everyone, whether they have a computer or access to a computer, is allowed to participate. Uh, we handle all the translation services, so there's no uh, group that may be left out because of a language barrier. Everyone's invited to participate. We'll help uh, increase the partnerships that you have and look at the ones that you do have your churches, civic organizations, and, and, and libraries, all your community-based organizations, and then build that high-quality database of all of those contacts and continue to enrich that over time. So a systems approach to engaging the silent majority, branding and marketing, fusion of communication and research, truly a plug-and-play solution. It's 100% customized to the district, finding that silent majority, commonly deployed initiatives, so everything that you're doing now We'll be able to incorporate that and make that part of the calendar and then handling all of that reporting and communication for you. Well, thank you. That's, uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of layers to what we do and it's, it's very comprehensive, but I wanted to give you a very high level uh, view of what we've been doing for districts across Texas. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them or give you specific examples of how we help districts if that would if that would be helpful. Does anybody have any questions? Or? Yes. I think they're going to wait. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you, Mr. Carter. it. Appreciate it. Information item number 5, change board meeting date for March 2. 2013 and canceled July 2013 meeting next year. Thank you for whoever got that. Sorry, Dr. Widow, would you like to speak? <laughs> if, you, if you'd like. It's, this is just uh, the, the July thing we do every year, and we just thought we'd go ahead if we're looking at changing the dates, so get it announced early so people would have that on their calendars. <clears throat> the March. Um, we will, that could be a significant meeting in the spring, uh, and uh, we want to make sure everybody can be here. There was, you know, we have a conflict, and we thought, move it now before your calendars fill up, and just and just get that in there. So we're just uh, uh, going to rec. You know, we just plan to make that move. So this is not going to be an action item. We're just letting you know that we're going to be changing the calendar for uh, that spring date and that summer date. Okay. Thank you, sir. And moving on to the discussion items, monthly financial bond report and new construction reports. Thank you, Ms. Kyer. We also have uh, uh, Missy Elias, our chairperson for our bond oversight committee, uh, scheduled to present their quarterly report. So at this time, we'd like to invite uh, Ms. Elias to come up and uh, uh, give her report. You have a copy of it distributed at, your, uh, at the board table as well. Hi, thank you for letting me come out tonight. Um, hopefully this will be one of quarterly updates on the Bond Oversight Committee so that we can keep you informed of topics of discussion. Just a general um, overview once again of the purpose of the Bond Oversight Committee. We're um, established to build trust within the LISD community. Um, we monitor, review, analyze information concerning the projects funded by the 2008 bond package. We're appointed by the board members. The committee serves as a citizen's advisory committee by ensuring bond dollars fund identified 2008 bond package projects within the budget. <clears throat> All this information is posted on the LISD website, so it's public information. As part of this process, the committee may make comments and recommendations regarding any proposed or contemplating changes in the scope of work that might be worthy of consideration in light of changing demographic information, educational, financial, or other district needs. Our committee is currently operating with 12 members. Seven of those members uh, served uh, last term, and then we've got five new members. We've had two meetings with this new regime in August and in September. Um, I was elected to serve as committee chair and Ed Pete was elected to serve as co-chair. At our first meeting, Dr. Waddell welcomed the new members. 
and conveyed the importance of trust and transparency, as well as the importance of the bond monies to improving the facilities of LISD. He stressed the importance of keeping the promise the district made to the voters about the uses of the bond monies, as well as maintaining accountability of the funds and com completing the respective projects. We um, look at the financial report and the construction report um, each month. Dr. Barnett discussed that the district had slowed the construction projects due to the downward turn in the economy, a decline in taxable values causing a delay in selling the bonds and as in order to honor the tax rate promised to the voters and a recent demographic study and the district creating a new vision for learning in school settings. We were sent the demographic study via email um, that was presented last term and so to our new members they got that. Um, questions were made concerning the bond money for infrastructure of technology as well as purchasing computer, computers and ex explained that the bond language uh, could provide for both. PBK Architects presented an update on the Marcus and Flower Mound ninth grade campus designs and it's interesting that um, some of the same questions from last year reiterated with our new members and they discussed why the ninth grade facilities um, were now being put on the current high school campus sites and it was explained that operational cost of busing and the convenience for the student curriculum were benefits as well as the efficiency in personnel. Um, many questions were um, brought up about the bond money of the ninth grade facilities um, for both Flower Mound and Marcus and um, we noticed that the building of the Harmon ninth grade facility ninth tenth facility as well as the Hebron facility showed a savings of twenty million dollars each when building those so as um, as our due diligence for the bond oversight committee we were wondering why we did not see those cost savings when we were building the flower mound and the Marcus facilities um, because we it was explained to us that those facilities were in the bond, when the bond, 2008 bond, they were at a higher rate because of, and then inflation, so we could build those buildings for less. So in looking at those, um, the bond oversight committee, we wanted to kind of understand what, what cost the ninth grade facilities were versus the cost of moving the athletic facilities away from those campuses and kind of figure out where those cost savings could have come from because once again we're also looking at the facilities assessment report and know that there are many schools within our district that need uh, renovations such as the cost savings from Hebron and the Harmon campus am I saying that right Harmon um, were able to provide for the rebuild of LHS so when we looked at that um, we noticed there was the basketball arenas were being built and it came up that possibly um, the building of athletic facilities um, could maybe transpose into cost savings. So that was one of the things that came up um, in the bond oversight committee was that possibly um, we, could, we could realize more savings from the building of the ninth grade facilities and um, athletic projects were not written in that bond. It was the ninth grade campuses that were. Um, we were given uh, detailed presentations of the facility assessment report for all campuses. Uh, much discussion about the importance of getting these campuses maintained as well as the cost associated with the targeted schools that were in most need. Um, we had updates on the Aquatic Center and its progress. John Martin from Southwest Securities gave a presentation on future bond sales. And the overall committee um, is diligent in upholding our mission to ensure that the 2008 bond dollars are within budget and accountable to the guidelines that the voters expected. Thank you. Thank you, Missy. Does anybody have any questions on that report? 
No? Okay. Seeing none, uh, Dr. Burnett, do we have any other questions on the monthly financials, the bond report? You, you have those those uh, reports in your agenda. Uh, they we have not yet addressed the issue of uh, the discussion that we had at the board workshop. We will bring that to you uh, and have conversations both with the bond oversight committee as well as to bring it back to you uh, in November for further uh, uh, discussion and, and information. Uh, one thing I would like to call your attention to: uh, we have had a under construction, we've had a uh, flood in our Flower Mound uh, High School, one of our gyms, and we had some uh, we had some uh, thought in the beginning that we could uh, go in there and sand that floor, uh, but it appears like the uh, water is uh, still present and it's going to be difficult to dry it out. So um, uh, we have insurance, but this the cost of replacement is less than our uh, deductible so we're going to proceed with the work uh, it should take us about four weeks we're going to proceed with that work uh, as soon as possible and bring it back to you for ratification in november okay miss latham you have a question dr burnett i have two questions for you what discussion i didn't hear everything you said you talked about we're going to Go back to the discussion that we had with the bond oversight committee and bring something to as as we you remember from our workshop we discussed the uh, possibility of reallocating some funds and we don't have that ready for you to for us to start talking about it but we'll have discussion with the bond oversight committee and then we will bring you that for our information discussion and action piece before we actually get to the formal real adoption of a reallocation plan. Okay, and then my next question dealt with um, the aquatic center. In the package that was on board book, it, I don't know if it was, um, if I was misreading it or if it was a typo, but it looked like those bond monies were originally from 2006. I think that's a typo. Okay. Uh, no, it's not, it's 2008 bond monies. Okay. It could have been a typo. But I thought, no. Apologize for that. No, that's okay. Anybody else have any questions? Mr. McDaniel? Dr. Burnett, the, the floor that's being replaced, will that be the entire floor or just partial floor? We think it's going to have to be the entire floor, and that, that's a practice gym, and we think that entire floor is going to have to be replaced. I think, uh, uh, Larry, you had some discussions about that today. Seeing no other questions, moving on to the John Martin <coughs> Show. Future sale of bonds. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, we'd like for Mr. Martin to come and talk to you about uh, the uh, item we've got. Uh, uh, we have it. At, this is a companion item to the uh, uh, action item where we're asking you to. Uh, uh, determine whether or not we want to proceed with a parameter bond sale and I believe we've got it scheduled for October the 16th uh, under certain conditions and I'll let John elaborate about that thanks dr. Burnett uh, thanks for having us tonight John Martin with Southwest Securities and Chuck Kobdish with McCall Parkhurst and Horton uh, he's your uh, bond counsel so uh, what we're there, there's two parts as dr. Burnett said that um, we have an action item come and uh, coming uh, to you here and a few items down uh, but really what we're uh, asking the board to consider tonight is uh, what we talked about last month in terms of uh, part one of this fiscal year's borrowing plan and we hope to have a competitive sale take bids on bonds uh, next Tuesday morning uh, being the, on the 16th and um, this would allow us really to the, the agenda item as we get to it will allow uh, for delegation of authority to Dr. Waddell and Dr. Burnett to uh, accept the bid so long as it meets certain parameters. We've done this in the past with refunding bonds where you all have, have delegated that so you don't have to have another meeting to come back and approve it. Uh, you can do that if you want, um, but it's not necessary. So we're, we're hoping market continues to be strong, good time to borrow money. Um, 
you know, we've we've lost a little bit in the, in the last couple of days. The you know unemployment uh, got better. Uh, that kind of came out of left field. So uh, that uh, good news: the bond market doesn't like that. So that tends to drive interest rates up. But it didn't. Really, they're so low right now that uh, we feel confident that uh, we'll do very well. Uh, as a addition, we went through the rating process. Um, as we always do with Standard and Poor's and Fitch. We just heard back from Standard and Poor's. We should hear back from Fitch in the next couple of days. And Standard and Poor's uh, pleased to report that they affirmed uh, the district's AA plus rating. Just a side note on that, because that's outstanding. I mean, Louisville ISD was the first school district in Texas to achieve a AA plus rating. And quite frankly, the only reason that you're not AAA rated, rated is because of the state legislature, is because of funding. Uh, concern of limited your limited ability to raise revenue so um, but the analyst that we talked to is uh, old line guy uh, Ed McLeod that some of y'all that have talked to him uh, in the past um, and we had a pretty uh, frank discussion about you know what happens I mean because that's going to be an ongoing issue and, and we're in and out of the courthouse and so forth with state funding and and felt like that you know districts like Louisville ISD that have uh, maintained uh, such strong financial practices uh, for you know proved it over a decade and proved that they can withstand the storm and and have a plan in place that if a storm comes uh, that they could weather it um, so I think that uh, we might be able to see them loosening that a little bit and consider uh, despite the, the limitation that we have uh, put on us by the state legislature to consider uh, districts like this is to get a triple A jump. So we'll keep reminding them of that conversation and, and hopefully we'll get there. But double A plus is awesome. You'll have, you still have the permanent school guarantee that gets you that one notch up to the triple A and, and assuming you all decide to move forward here uh, uh, and a few items down um, that um, we really think we'll have a really, really strong sell. There's not very many bond issues out there. Uh, Texas school bond issues out in the market right now. We think that this will be a real, real strong sale. Did I hit everything? Yeah. Just being a discussion. Anybody have any questions? What are the parameters that we're limiting you to on these sales? Not to exceed 34.5 million. We've advertised it as 34.2 million. Uh, the final maturity uh, not le not greater than August 15, 2029. That's what we've set it at. Um, and that's another thing that the Braden agencies, as a side note, Ms. Latham, we're excited about that while we look at it, we have, we have a lot of debt. School districts in Texas, if you're growing and you got kids, you, you got a lot of debt. That's just part of it. Um, but we're paying it off. I mean, we're, we're taking care of of paying our paying our debt, so they were impressed that our debt doesn't go like a lot of districts your size. They got to 2042. You all go out to 2029, so it's pretty impressive. Um, and then we've uh, uh, the true interest cost of the TIC uh, cannot uh, be any greater than four percent. So the four percent is pretty high right now, isn't it? It, it I is. I mean, for what's going on in the it is. in and the if, real world. Yeah, and if we want to, if you want to bump that down a little bit, you know, we we can do that. I, I would feel better. Okay. That's that's given a pretty nice. Well, given a pretty big. When, with when the percent. item comes up, Chuck, can they amend there? Yeah. So you could amend that to the parameter to say maybe three and a half percent. I think I would be comfortable. Mr. McDaniel. But that's no higher than, but what, what are you expecting the, the rate actually to come in at? You know, when we ran numbers on this the, the other day, um, we came out at about 2.6. So uh, not going to make any problem. A, a, a lot can happen in a week. Um, you know, so we've seen it uh, bump around between uh, that 2.2.5 percent, anywhere from between that to 3.1 percent in, in the last month or so. So just depending on uh, timing and so forth. So, uh, feel I, I feel like we should be th through three three percent. I really do. But um, you know, you got to be careful on these things because you know pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered, as they say in Texas. So, but in saying that, wouldn't we want that uh, 
Wouldn't we want to bring it down even further, say 3.2? I mean, if, if, it's, if it's jumping around a half a point, then, you know, if we don't yeah. know what we want, we come back in a yeah, in I think month? That you certainly can. And, and keep in mind that, you're, you're, you know, the delegation process is we can always, Dr. Waddell and Dr. Burnett can say, you know, we, can, we would look at the market even if we're 25 basis points over where we're seeing other issues selling at the time. You know, we would have the right to reject, they would reject the bids. And we could always come back out a couple of weeks later, go to a negotiated sale, whatever it may be, and, and come back out. So uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take the deal uh, if it's, you know, as long as it's below three and a half or 3.2 or whatever you decide to put it at. Does that make sense? You're just, you're just given an absolute maximum threshold. So at, at this point, we need to give that authority to? Okay. Yeah, action item four. Any other questions? And thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Okay, now we move on to our action items. Action item number one, consider approval of resolution affirming school district's eminent domain authority. I need a motion, please. Motion, Ms. Duke. Second, Ms. Latham. Any discussion on that? If we, this, this is an item that we we renew every year. Is that correct? No, uh, it's 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 not. Uh, we were advised that we we needed to do this. Actually, it's more of a formality than anything. It's really uh, we we start this as an information item. And we learned that probably it wasn't necessary, but we decided to move forward with it. Our, our attorneys advised us to go do this. It's just an affirmation, but uh, we don't expect to probably come back to you again unless something changes in the statute. I don't believe we need to read this into, uh, do we need to read this? No, okay. Good. Okay, anybody have any other questions? All in favor? That is unanimous. <clears throat> Moving on to number two, consider approval of construction contract for Westside Aquatic Center. I need a motion, please. Motion, Ms. Foudy. Second, Ms. Sheffield. Any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all in favor? That is unanimous. Item number three, consider approval of class size waivers request to the Texas Education Agency. I need a motion, please. Motion Ms. Sheffield, second. Ms. Duke. Questions? Concerns, comments? None? All in favor? That is unanimous. Item number four, consider adoption of an order Authorizi author sorry, authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax school building bonds, establishing sale parameters, approving an official statement, and enacting other provisions relating to this subject. Uh, Ms. Kyer, I move that we approve this action item with the revision of the maximum uh, true interest cost greater than 4%, that that be um, modified to be no greater than 3.25%. I have a motion, Ms. Latham. Second. McDaniel. Discussion. I would like to amend that to give uh, Dr. Burnett and Dr. Waddell the um, ability to uh, reject a bid if it came in if they felt like that it was not in our best interest at the at the sale. Okay. Um, I, I, I think I think we we do have the authority to do that. We don't have to. Don't we don't can. have to accept it. Uh, what this gives us with the uh, revision that Miss uh, Latham proposed, it just gives us the authority to accept this under your parameters. But if we if we're not comfortable with it, we don't have to accept the bid. So I think we already have that authority. 
withdraw that. Well, we, we can just say it failed for lack of a second. That would work too. That would work too. So then I need to make my motion again, or no? No, no. You yours was yours was uh, you made the motion. It was seconded, and we just need to. Um, well, actually, no. You didn't second it, did you? I need a second. Did he second? With it. Okay. He added that. That wasn't part of the second. Okay, well, never mind. Just thank you for seconding that, Mr. McDaniel. Anybody have any other questions, concerns? All in favor? That is unanimous. Okay, moving on to the consent items. I know we have to pull 2A for Ms. Sheffield. Are there any other ones that need to be pulled for consideration or discussion? Like have a little Jeopardy sound going on now. Number seven. Renewal of it, CSP number 2193-11 awards banquet facility. You want to pull that? Or do you have a question on it? Okay. So I need a motion to accept the consent, ad uh, consent agenda items um, minus 2A and G7. Uh, Ms. Kyer, I make the motion. Okay, motion Ms. Latham, second Ms. Duke. Okay, all in favor? That is unanimous. Moving on to item 2A, consider approval of memorandum of understanding MOU between LISD and Louisville Education Foundation. Um, anybody have any questions since we pulled it and Connie's here? I make a motion that we approve item 2A to consider approval of memorandum of understanding between LISD and LEF. I have a motion, Ms. Latham. Second, Mr. McDaniel. Okay. Anybody have any questions, concerns? Seeing none, all in favor? It is unanimous with Ms. Sheffield abstaining. All abstaining? You want to use your hand? I didn't want to take it away from you. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, moving on to G7. I need a motion for to approve the renewal of CSP number 2193-11 awards banquet facility. Motion, Ms. Sheffield. Second, Mr. McDaniel. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Foudy. Motion, Ms. Ms. Foudy. You guys starting to sound, I'm sorry. Second, Mr. McDaniel. Ms. Foudy, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. Um, um, it was my understanding we were um, possibly looking at still honoring our employees, but maybe doing it in a different fashion. Um, as far as personalizing it more as for such a big event, possibly bringing it down to smaller scale is, um, I guess my question is, is this open for further discussion and could we postpone it? until the next meeting. Ms. Primetti? Or are we going to lose the well, ability from, to from a standpoint of the, of the purchasing item, you certainly can postpone it. There's no compelling reason, I don't believe, that it has to be done tonight uh, just to get it on the calendar and, and be, start doing that. So the, the short answer is yes, you can postpone it. What would the consequences be? Would we probably not get the space? And I bring Mr. this up because it's a Mr. Prometti, can do you want to kind of elaborate a little bit in terms of answering her question about the event? Yes, so, well, you know, we, this time of year is a very busy time of year with proms and other sorts of functions, and we've looked at calendars, and this is one of the very few dates that we had open on everybody's calendar. So from that perspective, we could lose the date because, um, you know, we, when we end our date agreements, we we share with them the process of going before the board and going for um, contract approval. So I would have to talk with the Hyatt to see if they're willing to postpone it and keep us on the books for another month. And I bring it up because 
I of course want to honor our teachers, but with the budget situation that we're in on an annual basis, and this the cost of this event and rental seems to keep going up and up and up, and it, it, it doesn't include necessarily all of our employees. It just, I wonder if we've taken a step back and thought about how we could do the same thing for less money and in a more personal fashion. Um, I like the event because I think our, our staff really enjoys being able to go even though they all can't go this is something many of them look forward to I think they do the personal recognitions within their schools for their own staff I just I would hate to not have this event um, they've they sacrifice enough it's it's one night that some of them never see each other and get to really recognize each other so well, and you bring a good point, Ms. Scotty. Someone else helped me that's been on the board since last year. I thought we did have discussions about talking about doing something a little different that was more personable, that wasn't so huge, that would include everybody. We did do a survey. We surveyed all the participants who came. We surveyed those who didn't come. We did a district-wide survey. We asked for their feedback about the event. We, at, we gave them options. Would you like to see the event more personalized? Would you like to and gave them some options, some scenarios. We asked um, about the amount of awards, and basically they all liked it the way it's designed as is. They, the feedback was that they liked having it in one night. They liked, um, we talked about making it more teacher focused, and the responses were that our district is successful beyond, because uh, we have strong administrators and we have auxiliary staff that help make their schools um, successful, so they were very uh, focused on that. Um, we talked about should we make it smaller and at the time our, it, the data that was collected said no they liked it the way it, they, that it was designed. But would it be possible for you to share that with us because I didn't, I didn't know you, that that had taken place. Yes I can give that information to Dr. Waddell. And, and another quick, oh can I ask another question? Is, is it possible maybe we could get a corporate sponsor to help us? with the expense of that thing? We do get sponsors for the event. It doesn't cover the entire event. Um, and at this point in time, um, we can try. I can't guarantee that we can cover this large expense between now and April. And what's the typical expense on this? Sorry? What's the typical budgeted expense for this? I don't know. Um, do you want me to read that? It's in 2010-2011, it was $45,911. In 2011, 2012, 51,500, and it's anticipated this year, 63,142 dollars. So, how much of that do we, just percentage-wise, guesstimate? Don't be accurate. We usually get sponsorship for. We only get a few thousand dollars. It's not. It's not That's a not lot. A and we and we then. right. And we and it's and it, we've never ha we've never done that um, to go seek that sort of sponsorships. We've done it. Um, we've had several partners that have given us money, um, but because it doesn't cover the most of the expenses, it turns into more of the door prizes. That's what they've the, that they've covered. Um, as far as the expense going up, is just because of inflation. The price of foods going up. The price of technology to um, make sure everybody can hear for the screens. Price of labor. This is just a sign of inflation that their costs are going up too. And I, I just want to restate, I bring this up because I've, and I'm glad to hear that the survey data showed that the employees that attend appreciate the event. But I've had other employees state that like if they get the Teacher of the Year Award, it's kind of at the end of a very long ceremony and they feel like it's just kind of been washed out. Because that's a really big deal. I mean, when you're a Teacher of the Year, it's a big deal. And um, they've, you know, some people have thrown out the suggestion that if it was done in a you know, a breakfast or more personal setting that was still very special and, you know, still had the board of trustees. It, it, um, our team is looking at more, making so. it more personalized. We are looking at how we can incorporate video. We're looking to incorporate student voices in, throughout the evening. So we are looking at how we can change it to personalize it um, because we do know we get both ends of the spectrum. We have people that do say they want things more personalized. 
However, the majority said they liked it the way it is. So we are looking at ways we can personalize even more for those individuals that shared that with us. But I believe, and of course, it's been a while since I've looked at the data, but I, I want to say about 80% said they liked it the way it was designed. And we surveyed the entire staff? Yes, ma'am, we did. I personally, I, I think that when we hold this, um, having the whole district, or at least everybody that wants to be there under one roof, I think is a great thing because we, and um, it's, a, it's wonderful to see that the, uh, the staff being able to interact on a social setting where they generally don't get to unless they're working. And uh, they see old friends, new friends. Uh, they get to see some of the auxiliary staff that they might not get or haven't seen in a while. I mean, I, it's generally it's a celebration not only of, of the awards, but also of the year and how well it's gone. And it's a celebration of the district. Uh, so I think it's I think it's a great thing and sure there's always different ways that we can uh, change change it up a little bit to make it a little more personal if we want to have a teacher you more have a more of a video type thing cause that there's always options for that kind of change but I think this is one of the the great traditions that we have that we've had comment comes on when we've had speakers in the past that, that we actually do this and and that the, the staff just really loves it. Staff not only being the teachers, but also being the administrators and the auxiliary personnel, the bus drivers and, and the food, uh, the, the service people that they're just there along with them being celebrated, not only along with the teachers, but also because everybody there has an input into a child's education. So I think it's, it's a great opportunity. Ms. Kyer, I'd like to add one more thing. Um, because of our strategic design, it talks about um, recognizing our employees. And one of the things we are doing to, so there are some changes. We are looking at all the awards that we give out currently, and we're, gonna, we're putting a committee together to review that. We're also going to look at our strategic design and make sure our awards reflect our core uh, beliefs and the vision and mission of our strategic design to make sure there's alignment. So there will be some changes to how we move forward, but overall, if you look at the design of the event, it'll sustain, but we'll make some changes, um, a little changes here and there in the event to make sure it does align with our strategic design process. Any other comments? Okay. Um, so we have a, a motion by Ms. Fowdy, a second by Mr. McDaniel. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. And moving on, that is it. And we are adjourned. It, it is 8.50. Thank you all very much. We have a considerable number of documents that need signing. Oh, goody. From, uh, our, from our bond Did council. Did you bring snacks? <laughs> he may have, he may have uh, ordered some barbecue. I don't know. You order snacks? Okay. Thank you all very much. Uh, have a great week.